Well, welcome to the hills. Right now I'm talking to people across the city of Fort Worth, across the state of Texas, across the country, and literally across the world. So wherever you are, if you're online, thank you for joining us. And I'm also talking to people in person at NRH campus, South Lake campus, West Fort Worth campus. I'm so grateful you make it a priority to start your week honoring God and lifting up Jesus. And we'll be doing that in a moment in Mark chapter 6. So you can find that place in your Bibles and hold it for just a second. It's hard to believe it's been a year. It was at this time about a year ago that I was making a video to all the church saying, because of the uh, spread of this virus, we're going to have in, uh, online worship only this week and probably for a couple of more weeks. At that time, we thought maybe in a few weeks this will all be over. We had no idea we'd be online only for 26 weeks. And a full year later, we're still dealing daily with the uh, consequences of this pandemic. Now, what I'm about to say is going to make me seem shallow. But this is how I knew the pandemic was serious. When they canceled March Madness. When they decided not to have the National Collegiate Basketball Tournament I knew we were dealing with something much bigger than I first realized. Now, I love March Madness, probably because most of you know, as a youth, I was a stellar basketball player. I played on a select traveling team across the country out of California. Do we have a picture of one of my, uh, yeah. I was famous for my dunks. That's when I called my rim rocker. Now, when you see that picture, you immediately assume two things. Either number one, that is a cropped picture, or number two, that is a five-foot rim, right? Because here's the thing. I know we love to say, if you believe it, you can achieve it. You can do anything you set your mind to. I don't care how much I believe it. I am never going to dunk a basketball on a 10-foot rim, okay? In one sense, acceptance of impossibility is just a healthy acknowledgement of reality. But there's also a sense in which refusing to acknowledge that something just might be possible that is, in fact, a kind of captivity. So in this series, we're acknowledging that almost all of us believe God is real, but sometimes we wonder if God is always right. We're looking through stories in the Gospel of Mark where people second-guessed Jesus. Now, some of those people did so with wrong motives, but some of those people did so because they just sincerely thought Jesus was wrong. Because so often, Jesus said and expected things that just weren't logical. But they were always theological. In other words, Jesus always brought God into the equation. Jesus viewed reality through the lens of a greater reality. Which is why Jesus would often second guess our understandings of just what might be possible. Now we're going to look at one of the best known examples of that in Mark 6. To set the context, Jesus has sent his apostles out on their first ever mission trip. And they have just come back. Verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Now then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Now, I could do a whole sermon on just one paragraph. Let's just unpack a few of the nuggets. One thing is it might uh, change a little bit of your perception of what a day in the life of Jesus was like. 
Most of the movies, he's out there in a pasture with a few people around him. That wasn't his life. There have been a few people in history that were such a big deal that anywhere they showed up was a scene. That was Jesus' life. There were so many people around, they didn't even have a chance to get something to eat. Now, I don't want to ever be so popular that I can't get something to eat. I, I like my pizza and my cheese enchiladas way too much. But that was Jesus' life. For a long time, anytime he showed up in public, it was a crazy scene. And it was Exhausting. Because people are exhausting. I don't mean that as an insult. I'm just telling the truth. The needs of people can be exhausting. And you know that. Some of you parents this last year not only had to work at home, but you had to help your children with online schooling. And it was fatiguing every day. Some of you are taking care of aging parents, and the demands are unrelenting. Some of you are in service industries, your school teachers, your law enforcement officers, your health care professionals, and this last year was overwhelming. And Jesus, because he was fully human, got exhausted. He said to his disciples, let's just get away from Let's take a break. Let's get in a boat, go to the other side, and rest a little bit. And when they got there, the mobs and the crowds were waiting for them. And I probably would have been, oh, my, would you people just give me a break? And Jesus, even though he was out of energy, was never out of compassion. It said he had compassion on the people. And do you notice what it said next? So he began teaching them many things. Now, we don't usually associate teaching and compassion. But did you understand, according to Jesus, one of the most compassionate things you can do for anybody is tell them truth about God. That telling people truth about God is one of the highest expressions of compassion for people. Because man does not live by bread alone. But man does need bread to live. So let's keep reading verse 35. By this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. And it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to their surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, that would take more than a half year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Now, this doesn't show up in the English Bible, but in the Greek, the word you is emphatic. In other words, Jesus was being very specific. Uh, don't get a caterer. Don't find a food truck. You do it. I want you to give these people something to eat. Now, in John's gospel, it says that Jesus was testing his disciples because he had already decided what he was going to do. It's just one of many times where Jesus intentionally put his disciples in a situation beyond their human capacity. And that is the tension we're going to wrestle with today. That Jesus often puts us in places that are beyond what logic says we can handle. I know we're supposed to be like Jesus, right? We're supposed to live like and love like and act like and talk like Jesus. But the other side of it is, I'm not Jesus. I, I can't be like Jesus. Jesus walks on water. I slip on ice. Jesus curses fig trees. I kill houseplants. Jesus cast out demons. I take out the trash. Jesus changes water to wine. The best I can do is turn water into bad tea. Jesus cleanses lepers. The closest I've come is changing dirty diapers. 
Jesus can enter locked rooms. I can't even get into the kitchen of any of the campuses of the Hills Church. <laughs> and nobody wants to take a test if they know they've got no chance to pass it. So here's the tension. You ever wonder if Jesus, well, he just expects too much of us. He just wants too much. He just puts us in places where logically we can't pass the test. Let's talk about a personal level. Does Jesus really expect me to love my enemy? There's a lot of hateful people in the world. Have you noticed? Does he really expect me to forgive that person who hurt me so bad I'll never forget it? Come on, it's 2021. Does Jesus really expect me to be sexually pure if I'm not married? Does Jesus really expect me not to worry about tomorrow? Have you read the headlines? And that part about if, if because you're a Christian, someone mocks you or persecutes you, you're supposed to be glad? He wasn't serious, was he? Or, or what about at a corporate level? Does Jesus really expect his church to advance against the gates of hell? I mean, does he really think his church can overcome centuries of bias and hate between people groups? Does he really expect us to, to pray for healing and miracles like the first Christians did? Does he really expect his church to hold unpopular moral positions in a culture that doesn't believe in absolute truth anymore? And that part about going into all the world, well, Jesus, some parts of the world don't want us to come. That's the problem with you, Jesus. You're a good guy, but you expect too much. That's why the disciples second guessed him. His ask was just too big. The disciples would have made a great committee. You know what a committee is. It's a group of people who individually can do nothing and collectively decide that nothing can be done. And so listen, the disciples gave Jesus an answer. Any atheist could have given him. Nice idea, Jesus, but it's not in the budget. Can't make it happen. And their answer was not illogical. But it was not theological. So once again, Jesus is going to give his disciples tangible evidence that when you live inside the kingdom of God, you better learn to expect the unexpected. Let's keep reading. How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. And then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. And then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. And the number of men who had eaten was 5,000. You know, besides the resurrection, this is the only miracle story of Jesus in all four Gospels. And this was a game changer. This one totally shifted the paradigm. This one forever said, if you follow Jesus, you better learn to second guess what just might be possible. What does Jesus expect of us when logic says you can't do anything? Three things. Number one, Jesus expects us to apply past miracles to present obstacles. 
Now, the whole story started with the disciples returning from their mission trip, reporting to Jesus what they had taught and what they had done. Well, what did they report? Let's go back to chapter 6, verse 11, uh, 12 and 13. It says, they went out and they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Now, get this. The disciples have just returned from a trip where God is routinely doing the impossible through them. But soon after they return, they go from being believers to being calculators. And we do too. We all struggle with spiritual amnesia when it comes to how God has worked in our past. Maybe that's why Jesus said, I want you to pick up the leftovers. It wasn't just because he didn't like litter. He wanted each disciple to have a basket as a tangible reminder of the sufficiency of God. And I got a big question for you. What has God put in your basket? What has God put in your basket that he wants you to carry around so the next time you come up with a huge challenge, you can look in that basket and remember what God has done? I, I've told you this story before I came to this church, I was in great prayer, asking God for a sign if I should come, asking for an experience of supernatural peace, and God answered that prayer in a miraculous way. And I put that in my basket, because my first few years here were really, really tough, and every time I wondered, did I do the right thing, I'd look in that basket and I'd see that miracle. And out of that miracle, I received courage, and I received comfort. And then I think about our church. And we've got some big plans in our next vision to take the gospel to countries where it hasn't been welcome. But I got missionaries, especially in Greece right now from our church, working with refugees from the Middle East. And they're telling stories of those people having visions and having dreams and having supernatural encounters with Jesus. And we're putting all that in the basket. And we're remembering we're not taking Jesus anywhere. We're simply going where Jesus it already is. And so we're putting all that in the basket. And I want you to look, carry your basket around. Listen, forgetfulness leads to faithlessness. you got a basket. You've got stories of how God has shown up in your life in the past, and God wants you to apply that to the present challenge. So keep a basket in your hand and keep a do-it-again prayer on your lips because Jesus expects us to put his presence into practice. Jesus said, how much you got? They said, seven. We got five of this, we got two of that. Jesus was about to teach them to count to eight. So Jesus took the bread and the fish and he thanked God. And then he asked his disciples to pass it out. Now, to put yourself in the place of a disciple. Jesus would take the bread and he tear off a piece and put it on a cloth and put it in the disciples' hands. Say, that group over there of 100, go feed them. Awkward. You got to walk over there and open up that cloth and say, uh, unless God doesn't show up, you're going to look pretty foolish. Guess what? They got to distribute a miracle. Jesus put them on purpose in a place where God had to show up. He still does. To believe in God is not to deny reality. It is to rely on a greater reality. Do you understand? Our whole salvation depends on this truth. The salvation story started when God called an old man named Abraham and said, I want you to go somewhere you've never been where you don't know anybody. And if you're faithful, I'm going to give you a baby. And that, through that baby is going to come the Savior of the world. He's too old to have a baby. There is nothing logical about God's salvation plan. Listen to how Paul puts it. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though... At about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never 
wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. So get this. Abraham wasn't illogical. He faced the fact, my body is reproductively dead. Sarah's womb is reproductively dead. It's not, hey, if I'll just diet better and Sarah starts doing water aerobics, maybe we'll be young again. No, this isn't logical. But he stepped into a greater reality. Here's what it means. It means that old couple got into their tent at night and they do what a couple does who wants to have a baby. This is what faith does. It doesn't ignore reality, but it leans into a greater reality. Somebody's thinking right now, I can't. I can't forgive that person. I can't love those people. But Jesus can. And if you're a believer, Jesus lives in you. I can't stop that sin. I can't say no to my flesh. But Jesus can. And if you're a believer, Jesus lives in you. I can't stop being afraid. I can't stop worrying. I can't, I can't, I can't is not the question. The question is, can Jesus? And does he live in you? Jesus expects us to act like people who expect God to show up. For example, in Luke 12, he told his disciples, when you're brought into the synagogues before the leaders and other powerful people, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say. At that time, the Holy Spirit will teach you what you must say. And someone needs that word right now. You got someone in your life and they are in great pain right now and you don't know what to say. You got someone and they just had a great loss and you're afraid. You got someone who's far from God and you're afraid if you talk, you'll offend them. You need to step into that moment and trust that Jesus will show up and help you. And remember that part about going into all the world? What did he say next? Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I'm preaching to myself. It might surprise some of you to know how much I struggle regularly with feelings of inadequacy. I probably struggled more this last year than any in my life. I walk up the steps of whatever campus I'm preaching at, and most times I say this prayer, all I got here is loaves and fishes, God, and there's a multitude who need a word. You're going to have to multiply this because it's the best I got. I, I can't tell you how many times I have thought, God, I got nothing. But then I remember God has been making something out of nothing since the very beginning. That's what he's good at. And, and the reason this is so good is because that way the glory goes to God. As Paul put it. In 2 Corinthians, we've got this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So what does Jesus expect of you when you're in a moment that just seems too big? He expects you to look in your basket. He expects you to trust and act on his presence. And I think he expects our availability when we're facing impossibility. He doesn't need your capacity. He needs your audacity. He doesn't need you to own a chain of grocery stores or a bunch of food trucks. He needs you to bring him what you have. Because little is much when you put it in the master's hands. Here's the first task of obedience. It is to figure out what does God want done. What does God want done? The second task of obedience is not to look in the budget and see if you have enough resources to pay for it. The second task of obedience, once you know what God wants done, is to show up where God can do it. We don't make the miracle. But if we're available, 
we might just get to pass it out. You know, this next vision we're going to unveil this fall, it's huge. It's going to change the lives of children and marriages in Tarrant County. It's going to change the lives of people around the world. And I want to tell you something. We didn't create this budget by looking, or this vision, by looking at a budget. We spent time praying and fasting and saying, God, what do you want done? And if any of it gets done, it's going to be because God shows up. But he does. A pastor I know told a story. A 23-year-old woman came by his office on a Thursday and said, I was going to put this in the offering plate this Sunday, but I want to give it to you. Would you do it, please? And it was an envelope, but it had a, a sticker, a post-it note outside that said, be careful, sharp objects inside. He opened it up, and inside was a baggie with razor blades. This young woman grew up in a difficult home. She didn't know Christ. At the age of 12, she started cutting. Her arms bore the scars of years of hurting herself. And then someone took her to church, and she met Jesus. The story sounded too good to be true, which means it was. And she accepted Christ. But that old... That old flesh was still strong. And she's in a room one night, and she's got to go get that blade and cut herself again. That's how she had learned to medicate her pain. And she heard Jesus speak to her. I've bled enough. She put that blade up. She got those baggies, and she brought them to her pastor. Ironically, he had been struggling with whether or not he was making a difference. He found out, you just bring your loaves and your fishes, and you might just get to pass out a miracle. I told you last fall, a pastor friend of mine has three precious little girls. He reads them stories and fairy tales every night at bedtime, and the oldest is just getting big enough to start to question how true they are. So last year, they're reading, and, and she blurts out, that's not possible. And the youngest girl said, you're not the boss of possible. This story is not a call to lose sight of reality. This story is a call to keep Jesus in the picture. It's a call to second guess what just might be possible. Mark Galley is a pastor in California. He works primarily with Laotian refugees. He tells his story. He had a bunch of Laotian refugees in his home. Most of them don't know Jesus. They've never read a Bible. So they're in his home, and he's reading out of the Gospels that Jesus calmed a storm. Like a typical Westerner or American, he spiritualized the story. Well, what storms in our lives can Jesus calm? Room was completely silent. Finally, one man said, um, did you say that Jesus told the wind and the wave to be quiet, and they obeyed him? And Mark thought, I don't want to get bogged down in the possibility of miracles. Yeah, that's what I said. But the big idea is, what storms in our lives can Jesus calm? Again, silence. Then another hand. But if Jesus can order the wind and the wave and they obey him, he must really be powerful, right? And the whole room burst into excited chatter in their Laotian tongue. And Mark realized in this moment, they are grasping Jesus better than I am. Here's the big idea. Don't ever lose your wonder of Jesus. Maybe the problem isn't that, is that your challenge is too big. Maybe the problem is our picture of Jesus is too small. He really did walk on water. And he really did cleanse lepers. And he really did give blind people their sight back. He really did feed thousands of people with a sack lunch. That's what he did. He never sinned. But he died for yours and mine. And then he rose from the dead. That's our story. 
If you believe that story is true, then you have the capacity to second guess what just might be possible. Great faith in God is good. But faith in a great God is even better. So I want you to pray with me. Bow your head. And here's what I want you to do before we start to pray. Right now, I want you to imagine something in your life or in the life of someone close to you that just feels kind of hopeless. Now, I want you to ask God to help you see Jesus in that situation. Oh God, we need a fresh vision of Jesus. We need our wonder of Jesus restored. Help us to become like children and to hear the stories of Jesus with the same glee and fascination and awe that they do. And help us to believe that whenever your will and Jesus meet, it's about to happen. Give us bigger faith in Jesus. But give us the faith to see a bigger Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.